So welcome, Andrew, from the Puget Sound Concrete Specification Council, and welcome to your presentation. Thank you. My name is Andrew Marks. I am the Managing Director of the Puget Sound Concrete Specification Council. I have a uh, bachelor's and master's in civil engineering. My master's was in water and wastewater, so I have enough knowledge about the water stuff to be dangerous, but unlike some of the other speakers, I am not LEED certified. I am a concrete guy, and I don't know the stormwater regulations certainly as well as, as probably any of the other speakers, but I do know about concrete, concrete materials, and pervious concrete construction. I'm a member of the ACI 522 committee. I uh, do believe that uh, ACI 522.1-13 is the, a very appropriate specification. I think I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the working group that Jessica Knickerbocker with the City of Tacoma put together. We did some work on that specification primarily to get it into WSDOT and APWA format. So with that, I'm going to uh, start here. I'm also a member of the ASTM CO949 committee on testing for pervious concrete as well. I'm not going to try to take you through the full design and construction procedure. What I'm, what I'm going to attempt to do is highlight the steps that you need to take and the questions that need to be asked and answered in order to get to a design. Rigid pavement design is different than flexible pavement design. I very much appreciate some of Jim's comments from the previous presentation. You don't have to have a strong subgrade for a rigid pavement to work. The rigid pavement spreads load out so efficiently that you can have a very successful project over a long period of time as long as your subgrade support value is firm and unyielding and uniform. So we're going to talk a little bit about applicable specifications and test methods. What you don't want to do is make your project either unfeasible or add a cost without benefit to that. So it's really necessary to understand the specifications and test methods. You, you do not need to be able to specify a mixed design. ACI 522 will lead you to require a mix that is hopefully been used by the contractor and you've got doing your work, but you'll get a mixed design proposal from the supplier. It is very almost certainly going to be a mix that he has used elsewhere. You will be able to review that and approve that, and then that will become the mix against which you will control the rest of the project. You need to establish acceptance and rejection criteria and a test panel. Uh, for the pavement is uh, critical. Now, talk about the test panel for just a minute. At least in my mind, when you say the word test panel, the first thing I think of is going to a location and build a piece of pervious concrete pavement that you can look at, test, review, whatever, and then discard that and take it away or demolish it and uh, have it be gone. We don't have to have that. That's certainly acceptable, but it's also acceptable to incorporate the test panel into the finished work, and it's also acceptable to look at a different site where the combination of the contractor's means and methods has been used with the supplier's mix to create a successful job. So what you're looking for in a test panel is a couple of things. First of all, you want to know that the mix and the methods, installation methods, can combine to give you a successful project. So that's a confirmation step. But in addition to that, you want to create a communications channel so that everybody has a clear idea of not only what is desired and acceptable for the finished work, but also what is not acceptable. So it is perfectly valid and I would suggest even desirable to intentionally create a portion of the test panel that is unacceptable. So you can do things like over compacting so it gets pasted over or allow a portion of it to dry out so that the surface ravels and it doesn't stick together. Both are common faults in pervious concrete design. So if you get agreement going in that this particular area is what the target is, what it's supposed to look like. These other areas where we've intentionally done things to make it 
not desirable, we're going to leave those in place as well so that if we get any of those things happening in the field, we all have, we, we've already agreed that that's unacceptable and needs to be corrected. So I think one of the things I'm going to touch on in a few minutes later in the presentation is that with pervious concrete, you know what you're going to get. You don't have to wait 28 days. You don't have to wait 28 hours. You will know right at the time whether that material is going to be acceptable and if there is something that needs to be corrected, you should correct it on the site at the time it's being placed and don't let that get hard because it's a lot easier to fix it before it gets hard and there are some procedures for doing it. So it's really important to set expectations. A lot of issues in construction come up because of unmet expectations, but sometimes those expectations are not shared. So one party will go off meeting the target that they're shooting for in their mind and then when they do a good job doing that they find that somebody else thought it was going to be different and they, they haven't you know, been successful. So we want to make sure that going into a project you have shared expectations between your owner, engineering team, the materials supplier, contractor, so that you understand what materials are going to be used what the appearance of it is going to be, what the surfaces and tolerances are, what the performance is going to be, initial and long term. We need to talk about construction sequence, about timing, and jointing will go not only to the performance of the finished product, but it will also go to the appearance. And then curing is a very crucial step with uh, pervious concrete. And then we want to talk about opening and use of the of the pavement. So it's very important that we get an idea going in and sometimes we make assumptions and you need to be aware of those assumptions and test them. So your check and balance uh, in the specification, what you're going to do is once you have a an approved mixed design that will become part of the specification and part of the expectations for the project and every load of concrete that's delivered to the site will come with a batch ticket and you will be able to look at the proportions on that batch ticket and check it for compliance with the mix design and it should also have the same identifying number on that batch ticket that is identified with the submitted mix design and you will have an initial check there that says you are getting or not getting the same mix that you agreed that was going to be delivered to the site and if that batch ticket isn't right, you don't need to discharge any of that concrete. You would, you would send it back before any of it ever gets on the ground. Thickness is the single most important value to measure and to be sure of in the long-term performance of a, of a pervious pavement system. The strength of the section is proportionate to the square of the thickness, so small changes in thickness result in large changes in section strength. You do not want to have any thin places because that's what's going to show up at the surface as a localized failure. So do your due diligence and check thickness before the concrete is placed and during its place. You don't have to wait to take a core to see if you have a sufficient thickness of concrete. The visual appearance is another huge tool to see whether or not you're getting the product you thought you were going to get and you need to make sure that the appearance is not only correct but it's uniform. You don't want to have variability and if it is not what it is what you expect long term same comment as before. Remove it and you can just simply take that material and cast it ahead and you know those rocks work equally well in a base as they do in the surface so you don't have to actually remove them but you need to take them away from the finished surface and uh, do that before the concrete gets hard. Permeability should not be an issue. If, if the visual appearance is acceptable in all likelihood the permeability is going to be far in excess of what you need and I believe at the end my website theconcretecouncil.org there's a projects tab and in the center of that projects tab is a little short video that uh, has uh, water coming out of a ready mix truck and onto a pervious concrete pavement and it 
you know, disappears very rapidly, then that, that test is somewhere between 800 and 1,000 inches an hour. And as Mark said, you only need one inch an hour to handle the vast majority of, of storm events in the Puget Sound region. But you don't have to wait for the concrete to get hard. You can take a five-gallon bucket, you can take a uh, plastic water bottle, a cup of water, and you can pour that on the surface of the concrete at the time it's being constructed and know whether the water is going to go away or not. And again, if, if there is any issue, you, you need to stop and correct that before it gets hard. But you don't have to wait for the concrete to get hard before you can get a pretty good idea of whether or not it's, it's going to infiltrate appropriately. You can test for thickness. You can string line the forms and see if there's room to get adequate thickness of concrete in there. You can measure the cores after the concrete gets hard and see if they're thick enough. You have tests. It's basically a unit weight test on the plastic concrete that will determine whether or not they can achieve the density you need. And then you will also have a test you can perform on the hardened concrete from the core and then the permeability. And there's several different ways to check permeability. The likelihood is you don't have to worry about a quantitative permeability test. It will be very adequate, more than you need. And if there is any kind of an issue, there are test specifications that will allow you to enforce that and take corrective action. Hopefully, you don't have to get into a rip and tear situation. I, I have never yet seen that eventuality come, come true uh, on any of the projects I've worked on in this region. But you know it could happen. And, and as engineers, we want to make sure that we, we maintain the ability to, to have the permeability assured. So, there's a couple of different steps that can be taken to assure that. The first one, obviously, is the presumptive test that you're going to do with a little water before the concrete gets hard, just to make sure. Remove and replace is a last resort. Okay? The visual control, the appearance of the concrete, is huge. You engineers that are going to be observing out in the field, you can attend the same certification class that the contractors have to go through. You don't have to go through the, the full procedure and get actually get certified as a contractor, but you can learn what their targets are and, and how to effectively observe uh, what's happening as well as the final appearance. And the, the watchword here is if there is a situation where you have a problem in the hardened concrete, it is because people didn't avail themselves of the opportunities before it gets hard. So you want to you keep that in mind if you want to correct any issues during the placement step. So talk about pavements for a second. Concrete is a rigid paving material. It has a high modulus of elasticity. What that means is if you push on it uh, a lot, it doesn't move very much. So kind of think about a diving board. Flexible paving material would be a springy diving board. So it push a little on it, it moves quite a bit. A stiff material is the opposite. You push on it a lot, and it doesn't move much. So concrete is a rigid paving material, has a high modulus of elasticity, and pervious concrete is concrete. So the primary difference between the paving systems is that in rigid pavement, concrete pavement, the surfacing course is the pavement structure. It does not rely on the layers of rock beneath it to add strength to the section. The rock layer beneath the pavement is a placeholder for water, so you can store water so it can infiltrate into the soil slowly. And its, its only real requirement is that it is uniform and firm and unyielding. So when we talk about using a number 57 stone, uh, an inch and a half drain rock, a two inch drain rock, all that's really required is that that gets into a stable configuration. And if it is stable enough that you can build on top of it, it is going to be adequate for the, the needs of the pavement system structurally. So when you're thinking about designing and specifying using a pervious concrete pavement system, I'd, I'd suggest the first thing you do is, is ask for help. The help's out there. Um, the Puget Sound Concrete Specification Council is a, a nonprofit trade association. I am accessible by phone, by email, 
and I am very willing, able, anxious to help you get started on the right stuff and supply you with specification language, with details, with uh, anything you might need, and also connections to other people that can help in areas that I don't have expertise in. So come with questions about soil support values or soil questions, I'm very likely to turn you back in the direction of Jim Brisbane or somebody else in his office. Uh, so I will make the commitment to get you the help to get started. Your design decisions will dictate the cost of the project. So that's, that's really important for you to remember. You can, by your design decisions, you can make the project more or less expensive. And you can also affect the performance of that system positively and negatively. So uh, it's also you know, very important to know, you know that I'm aware that it's your name and you have the ownership of the project, not me. So I'm, I'm going to get good information in your hands so that you can make those design decisions and be confident about them. The other thing that I would encourage you to do and think about is to learn from what others have done. You don't have to reinvent the wheel yourself. And so talking to other folks, whether it's me or Mark Palmer or somebody else, you can gain benefit from other folks' experience and use of different pervious uh, concrete applications. In order to do design, you need really not much information. Most soils reports will tell you how strong the underlying soil can be. And in a conventional pavement situation, you want to make that underlying layer strong and then build a pavement layer, surfacing layer over the top of that that is going to help keep that strong. In a pervious or porous pavement situation, that isn't true anymore. We want to look at the soil support value in a saturated condition when it will be at its weakest point. So if the soil can be weakened with water, we need to be that the pavement system to still be able to perform as advertised in that weakened soil condition. So you need to assume a poor soil uh, support value, but the big benefit there is that rigid pavements are very insensitive to soil support value. And what I mean by that is if you do run the design numbers for the same loading, over a strong soil and a poor soil, it is unlikely that your pavement thickness recommendation is going to vary much at all, if any. So that's uh, you, there really isn't very much of a penalty to pay for assuming a poor soil condition. The loading is important. In typical normal pavement design, we look at easels, which is equivalent single axle loads. Those are not applicable to rigid pavement design. And we need to understand how the loading is applied. And what, what you're going to find is that the heavy single axle load will drive the design. And you need to quantify the axle weights and quantity of axles within the, the axle weight categories. And there's some design aids to help you do that. Street Pave is a rigid pavement design software. The other selection is, you know, it's what design life you want to use. And for rigid pavements, there is not any reason to specify, you know, something less than certainly 20 years. And I typically use 30 years as a design life. And if you uh, live anywhere in the Puget Sound area, you drive routinely on pavements that, you know, were designed many years ago for a shorter design life and are still in service. So. For a number of reasons, rigid pavement design is ultra conservative, and you should expect your pavements to last at least their design life and, and probably much longer. So you're going to quantify the loading. That would be the uh, traffic condition. You're going to quantify the soil support value. And if you don't have data available, you can take a look at the soil type and guess for you know, on a, with, for a lower value, not a higher value. I am a very conservative designer, and I urge you to as well for the simple reason that there is very little cost penalty with rigid pavements to being very conservative with your design. The properties of the material are modules of, that, of elasticity before. That's E here on the screen. And um, normal concrete has a modulus of elasticity of about 4 million, and that's going to equate to a flexural strength or a modulus of rupture of somewhere in the 500 to 600 PSI range. For pervious concrete, 
I use 375 PSI, which is going to give you a modulus of elasticity of about, about 2.5 million. That is a conservative number, and I am very comfortable recommending you use that. Uh, street paint will give you, give you the opportunity to test different values and see where your comfort factor lies. Then the other thing you're going to design, again, under street pave, is the end of life condition. And you're going to identify a ride and percent crack slabs. The failure mode of a rigid pavement is uh, fatigue. And so you will be able to tolerate a certain amount of crack slabs and still have adequate serviceability and ride. But you're going to define what that end of life condition is for the uh, mathematical model. We talked a little bit about street pave. You can use it free online for, I think, 30 days. You may be tempted to go to the Ashto Design Guide for rigid pavement design. It is not applicable for pervious concrete pavements, and it is also not the right tool for low volume streets and roads. It is a much more applicable tool for use in designing freeways and high volume pavements. There are some other pieces of software that might work, but uh, Street Pave is the one that I recommend and, and use myself. OK, so everybody's always interested in what's new. There is a project that is going on right now using pervious concrete on an elevated deck. That was based on a research project that was commissioned by the Washington Department of Ecology and conducted by Dr. Lee Hasselback at WSU. And what they found was that as water passes over the surface of the pervious concrete, some changes take place at the surface. There is excess calcium ions available. The, the pH changes rapidly. Copper and zinc are removed at a level of over 90% in less than a second of contact in runoff through pervious concrete. And her data suggests that that phenomenon will last a minimum of 20 years. And that was the basis of the selection of pervious concrete to be used on the Vashon Island Ferry project. Another piece of the, the puzzle that has been an issue is curing. Surface applied curing compound that we use in normal concrete is not really applicable for pervious concrete because of its porous nature. So we've had, we've been restricted to covering it with plastic. And uh, that presents some issues. It makes the, some challenges to jointing. It creates waste plastic, but we really haven't had any alter alternatives up until now. But what a, a recent development is the use of polymers, which is the same stuff that they put in diapers to hold water. Put these polymers in the mix, which in those polymer particles will retain water in the paste fraction of the concrete, and it uh, likely will reduce or eliminate the need for covering with plastic at all. It provides continuous moisture, continuous curing in the concrete, and will likely facilitate saw cutting joints in previous concrete as opposed to hand tooling them. And Mark has uh, made the decision that they will be using the internal curing on the 39th Street project in Puyallup, which is nearing completion of design, and we've, we're in review of that right now. So that's a pretty exciting advancement in the technology and uh, one that is going to be accessible to most everybody in the very near future. Permeous concrete is a preferred permeable pavement of the Department of Ecology, and permeable pavements are or soon will be required in Puget Sound region jurisdictions. Mark Palmer has made the statement that there will be no more conventional pavements on new construction or reconstruction in Puyallup. It will be porous asphalt and permeous concrete or another permeous option. Millions of square feet of pervious concrete surfaces have been built and are in service in the region. And I think I've got a few pictures to show you. Yes, this is six acres of pervious concrete at the Tulalip Q Casino. If you go to my website and look at that little video clip, this is the project that test was performed on, about six acres. Another shot of the same project. This is another project in Lacey. There's about, I think, six acres on this site. Now, the pavement to the left is conventional asphalt. The stripe in the middle is, the, is conventional concrete for the loading dollies to land for the semis. These are short semi-trailers, so obviously the dollies are landing on the, the pervious concrete, which is, let's see, pervious concrete is from this point over to the building. 
and then the asphalt would be from this point out, and this is conventional concrete. So all, all of the area from the edge of this strip to the loading dock wall is pervious concrete, and obviously all of the water on the site runs onto the pervious concrete, which is not a great or desirable situation, but it does work. There's about, uh, let's see, I was wrong, 80,000 square feet, that's a couple of acres. There's three buildings built at build out this that'll be double this size. Uh, plan is to have about a million square feet under roof of this location. The SeaTac headquarters fire station, all the surfaces on the fire station are paved with pervious concrete, and this was done so that they could avoid a stormwater re retention vault and a pump station to pump out of the vault. This is the mile sand and gravel plant at Kent. All the surfaces in the, this site are pervious concrete, and it sees loaded ready-mix trucks, and loaded rock trucks, pretty much every day. And uh, it's right beside Highway 167 in Kent. You can see it from the freeway. See their sign as you go by. This is the Pinehurst Safeway in Seattle, and there is a strip of colored concrete for the walkway and some colored pervious concrete at the front of the store. This is about 1.6 acres, if I remember right. Uh, Stratford Place up in Sultan. Interesting story. The developer built all the surfaces out of pervious concrete to avoid having to build a stormwater retention structure and lose some of his real estate. It was going to have to be a gated community because the city didn't know about pervious concrete and was unsure about taking it over for maintenance. But once they saw, got their eyes on it and drove their fire trucks over it and got some of their questions answered, they agreed that they would take over Stratford Place uh, as a public right-of-way, and the gates uh, didn't have to be put on. This is the Lacey Thurston Athletic Complex. All the surfaces in the center, there's five baseball diamonds that come together, so there are restrooms, a concession stand, picnic tables, playground equipment, so lots of foot traffic, barefoot traffic. All these surfaces are pervious concrete, but this this band in between the two conventional concrete bands, also up, up here in the upper photo, that is a clear access loop for emergency vehicles, and it's built thicker to accommodate those loading. Thank you, Andrew. That was great. Very interesting. And so Andrew will take questions now if anybody wants to type in questions. I'm sure there's something up. Oh, here's Art Castle. Hi, Art. That was a pervious concrete parking lot at the Tulalip Casino. It was done by the Tulalip Tribe, and right adjacent to that parking lot is Quilceda Creek, and they have salmon right. swimming. But that was one of their driving forces for, for that installation. The point I'd make is that these are not trial sites. These are full-scale, in-service uh, projects that are done by developers primarily, private entities, some public. And so Valerie asked if there are advantages to using a geogrid with pervious concrete not structurally, and, and I don't know why you would use GeoGrid if it wasn't a structural application, but the only advantage might be is, is if you cannot get a stable working platform to actually build, get equipment to build either the rock layer or the pervious concrete. In that case, it might be beneficial as a temporary uh, construction step, but it, it would not have a value to the pavement structure. Has anyone tried overlaying pervious concrete with a second layer of pervious, a few inches thick? Yeah, there. Uh, no, the short answer is no. And and one of the one of the attributes of rigid pavements, all rigid pavements, and in pervious concrete is a subset, uh, is you really can't do anything to add structure or add longevity. Uh, you have to build the structure for its full lifespan. So there are there are issues with overlaying. Uh, any pervious pavement because you don't, we, we do, certainly, you know, we can have some control over the permeability and porosity of the layer itself, but the interface between layers presents another question that is more difficult to answer. But in short, for, for rigid pavements, you, you don't add, bonding new layers to old layers is always a difficult issue, and you would not be able to accomplish that task reliably but the other factor is there's really no reason to do it. You need to build the entire structure uh, at the first, and you don't get any added value by putting a thin layer uh, over the top of it. 
And if you've ever noticed when you come up to a stop sign or somewhere where they've dribbled concrete out of the, of the back of a truck onto the asphalt, it's there forever. In places where they've tried to overlay concrete with asphalt, it, it doesn't stick, it comes off. So overlaying concrete with asphalt with porous asphalt is also not enough. So overlays are off the board for, for pervious concrete. So do you know of any examples on high volume roads? You know, Mark uh, Palmer's uh, 39th Street project in Puyallup is, is going to be the, the groundbreaker on that. The issue isn't volume, the issue is the speed because any pervious or porous pavement has the potential of fracturing out discrete particles and at higher traffic speeds those can get picked up in tire treads and become projectiles. So right now we, we recommend pervious concrete use below design speeds of about 35 miles an hour or so, but mm -hmm. in terms of volume uh, there really isn't any limitation. I mean we're taking uh, truck you know, and bus loading routinely on rigid pavements and the, the structure is very adequate to handle those loads.